Okay, should have a uh, question coming up. Uh, and that question is, does the Pentagon have too much power? That should be an easy answer. <laughs> so we'll ask you to take a minute or two to answer that. Looks like it's splitting. You can see it right down here at the right for the panel members. Still adjusting. Well, I have the honor. I'm Ben Frankly. I have the honor to uh, moderate this next panel. We have a great group of uh, folks to talk to, a little bit different from what we've heard this morning. So we have Dr. Corey Shockey, who's the Deputy Director of uh, the International Institute for Strategic Studies. She's also a distinguished research fellow at the Hoover Institute uh, recently and is the editor with Secretary Jim Mattis of the book Warriors and Citizens, Americans' Views of Our Military. She served in the NSC, DOD, and State for starters, but she's just getting going. Uh, Major Matt Cavanaugh is an Army strategist and a non-resident fellow at the Modern War Institute at the United States Military Academy. He wanted you to know that he's just completed his dissertation. How about that? Is that pretty great or what? He's uh, earned a Youngest uh, Strategist Award from the Army, and he's also Army Athlete 2009, so he's the wow. complete soldier warrior. He has uh, got a book coming out in May, but he tells me it's out here called Strategy Strikes Back, How Star Wars Explains <laughs> Modern Military Conflict. Uh, to his right is Dr. Uh, Janine Davidson, she's president of Metropolitan State University in Denver. She focuses on student success and better serving the university's 20,000 students. She also served as 32nd Undersecretary of the Navy, which isn't too shabby for a combat C-130 pilot. <laughs> so we talked about cross disciplines at Arizona State University. Here's a cross service uh, leader. And to her right is Dr. Elliot Cohen, a, a Robert E. Osgood Professor of Strategic Studies at John Hopkins University School of Advanced International Study, where he's taught since 1990. And his most recent book is The Big Stick, and he served both in DOD and with the Department of State. So our question is, does the uh, Pentagon have too much power? So we'll start on the right. What say you? Uh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but but right. I'll, I'll, let me say a couple. Let me turn it into a, a discussion of civil-military relations. And that's where we want to go with this yep. panel, by uh, the way. Thank you. So this is an academic's pri privilege to hijack the discussion. Uh, so I guess I, just a, a few quick observations. The first thing is that uh, civilian suspicion of the military is baked into the nature of our institutions. Uh, I always tell people on July 4th, when I hope every one of you reads the Declaration of Independence in its entirety, including the boring pieces at the end, <laughs> that you'll notice how many of them have to do with what is summarized in one phrase, he, King George III, has, has affected to render the military independent of and superior to the civilian power. So there are all kinds of historical reasons for this, which I'm not going to go into, but I think it's very important to understand that a certain kind of wariness about military power and military authority goes back to our founding. It's deep in our institutions. Of course, it's reinforced when you have the Pentagon the way it is. There, there are some features of the current uh, nature of civil-military relations which have to do with uh, the, the personalities, I think, of our recent presidents and our current president. I'll, I'll leave you to think about, uh, think about that one. Some of it has to do, I think, just with the, some fundamental differences between military people and uh, civilians, which can actually be quite productive. I have a book on that, separate subject. But I think the, uh, the big issues which I want to just uh, float for you is this. Uh, there are really two big issues. The first is the United States made a decision which was perfectly sensible and which cannot be reversed to have an all-volunteer force starting, let's say, in the uh, late 1960s. It's really the early 70s it takes place. Once that happened, and once we decided that at the same time we would remain the global superpower, we were setting ourselves up for a certain problem uh, where the military really does become a world apart. In a variety of ways, I believe we've made that, uh, we have made that worse, and in sometimes subtle ways, uh, to include some of the military's own recruitment 
uh, preferences and, and practices. So that's, that's one big one. The second big one, which I think is something for us to think about, is we've been waging war now for 17 years. Those wars have been, in most cases, I would say, either marginally successful, unsuccessful, uh, or simply uncertain. And there is a long-term effect from that, and I don't think we've thought enough about that. I don't, we, you know, we obviously think a lot about the stress that's imposed on the, uh, the sergeants and the captains. Uh, there is stress that's been imposed on the general officers, uh, and that is, con that is consequential. And I think that, con that contributes, in a way, to a, a certain kind of civil-military divide. I'll just conclude by saying, do I think this is a crisis? No, I think it is endemic to our system. I think it's just we're going through a period where it's somewhat more inflamed than usual. <coughs> Thanks, Judea. So does the Pentagon have too much power? Do the generals, including admirals, oh, by the way, have too much power? And I would say they have an immense amount of power. Um, they have, a, a, first of all, for, I would say for three reasons. Number one, because they have all the money. The Pentagon has way too much money compared to the other agencies of government, especially the State Department, and even the Pentagon says so. Um, so that's one area of power. Um, another reason why they have a lot of power is because they have a lot of respect among the American people. And now whether that's going to sustain, we can talk about um, further. But um, you know, compared to the Vietnam era, we all know that there's a thank you for your service culture out there that is almost a fetish at this point. Um, so that gives them an immense amount of power in a way. And then um, third, in, in this administration at least, but I don't think it's just this administration, we have, we have senior military officers peppered throughout other agencies and in the White House, and now we have retired four-star in charge of the Pentagon as a, in a civilian slot, which I absolutely love, General Mattis, but he is a general. And um, you know, when people uh, out in the society feel comforted by the fact that we're putting admirals and generals, and especially you know, retired four-stars in these sorts of positions, or as the um, National Security Advisor, uh, be precisely because they're worried about the president, people like us who think about this a lot should be a little worried. That's, you know, I mean, General Mattis may be the exception that proves the rule, but let's be clear that we're making an exception um, here. So those are sort of three areas where I do think that the military has a lot of respect, a lot of authority, a lot, they're in positions of authority, they have a lot of resources, so thus they have a lot of power. The bigger question is, so what? Are they using that power? And this is where I find, um, you know, for in ways that would worry us. And um, this is where the sort of the ethos of the professional military officer is really something that we should be comforted by. Um, I, you know, now that I don't live in Washington anymore and people ask me these kinds of questions a lot, I have to say to them, you, you have to understand how deeply embedded into the ethos of the professional military officer the idea of civilian control is, and I think still remains. Um, that's something that is, is nurtured in our educational system, and I think it's something that we have to continue to discuss where the lines are. So, yeah, they have a lot of authority on the one hand, but they're still um, immensely professional in that sort of Huntington sense of civilians are still um, in charge. Okay, Matt? So the last thing that I had something to say at last event was at Easter at my house surrounded by small children. So I'm well poised to spot the kid at the grown-ups table, and that's me today. So sitting next to these giants, I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, and I hope that you apply the same standard to me that I do to my kids, which is to say that as long as I don't spit up on myself or make a mess of things, that Easter will be very kind to me. Um, the, the original prompt for the panel was, uh, does, do the generals have too much power? And you might not be surprised that I would say no, um, that I'm sort of biased, uh, but it's a little bit like asking a servant on Downton Abbey whether Lord Grantham upstairs has given too much power to the servants. And I think that servant response would be, the servants have as much power as Lord Grantham thinks that we need. 
Um, and I think that discussions on civil military relations actually benefit from a downstairs perspective, a bottom up perspective, because so much of civil military relations is presidents and prime ministers and generals and admirals. Um, and so I wanted to raise that downstairs perspective, which is growing partisanship within the military. So um, I, I think that we're at danger of, of losing our norm of nonpartisanship. And I come at this not as a deep researching academic, um, as someone with lived experience. So a year and a half ago, I was serving in a headquarters in Korea uh, during the primary season. And we would literally uh, huddle in a bunker and watch on a screen um, during the debates, and you could watch the partisan invective emanate from the screen and divide the soldiers that, that were there. I stood next to a Mexican-American soldier, and I could almost physically, literally watch his skin crawl. Um, when I returned from that assignment uh, to a place in Colorado, a base that I won't name, uh, but I was greeted at my new desk, uh, not by a, a smiley, friendly colleague, but by a continuous steady supply of, of robocalls from one of the political parties because at my government phone at a government desk, one of the previous occupants had been aligned with a political party. That shouldn't be the case. So I started digging into the numbers. And uh, in one generation, we've seen a marked shift in partisanship within the military. So in 1976, when surveyed, 55% uh, of officers said that they were either independent or nonpartisan or not affiliated with a party. In 2009, the same question was asked, and the number was down to 16%. And I'm sure there's more recent figures in your book, Warriors and Civilians. Um, Behavior-wise, when at, surveyed in 2010, 27% of officers said that another officer had tried to influence their vote in the 2008 election cycle. And then um, Colonel Heidi Urban's uh, study in December of 2015 of 500 West Point cadets and National Defense University colonels found that over a third uh, had observed or shared insulting, rude, or disdainful comments about elected leaders. And then I'll, I'll get past the numbers, but one last data point I think matters, and that's elected uh, retired officers endorsing elected uh, or um, presidential candidates. So there's sort of a moment of inception in the early 90s where we had one admiral uh, endorse one candidate, then candidate Bill Clinton. And we now expect that every election cycle there'll be hundreds of retired officers endorsing presidential candidates. So there has been a marked shift in a generation. And I, I was just at a, at a conference at West Point where we were talking about these issues and some very smart people said there's no crisis. Um, that absent a physical threat by the uniformed military against the civilian leadership, we don't have a problem. But I think that's the wrong standard. Just as peace isn't the absence of war, healthy civil military relations is not the absence of an imminent threat on the nation. Um, so, the, to me, the problem really is that we uh, don't agree on a problem that we have a problem, um, and it's, it's almost as if we, we think that things could get bad, but we don't know how bad they could get. It's as if we've all jumped off a building and we're arguing about where the cement floor is. But we know that there is a cement floor and we know it's bad, and I would remind everyone today's April 9th. 153 years ago today, General Robert E. Lee, West Point class of 1829, surrendered to Lieutenant General Ulysses S. Grant, West Point class of 1843. The Civil War was only so devastatingly possible because 27% of West Point graduates in the decades leading up to the war chose politics, voted with their feet for secession, and then took up arms against the U.S. government. So that sounds alarmist. It's not meant to be, but it's, it's how serious I think the stakes are with partisanship within the military. So. Thank you. Tor uh, Corey. Uh, so there are a couple of different issues that people have been kicking around. One is politicization of our military, and the other is policy influence of our military. Uh, and I want to treat them separately. Um, the most important thing anybody has ever said about civil-military relations was Elliot Cohen during the 2000 election when he argued that it was really important for George W. Bush to win the election so that the military could learn to hate Republicans again. Right? <laughs> 
because you saw so much in survey data about military attitudes towards President Clinton and, and the Clinton administration. And what they were capturing was the military's abiding earnestness that, that we should be better than this, that values matter, that, and, and American society is so much more tumultuous than that. And you also saw during the Bush administration exactly what Elliot said would happen happened, which is military officers' views became much more uh, critical of the Bush administration. And then when you had the Obama administration, it shifted back again, right? So the, the important news is that the military should always be skeptical about the extent to which our elected political leaders are trying to use them as socially valuable and politically valuable backdrops for their policies. The second thing I would say is that there's a reason that the public likes the military and doesn't like anybody else. And it is that abiding earnestness, the problem solving, the please don't drag us into the big tumult, we're just trying to do what the country needs from us. That's endearing, and if other institutions of American government would like to have that kind of relationship with the American public, that opportunity is available to them. <laughs> they are simply not taking it. And it's not just elected politicians. If you think about the way most foreign service officers engage on American foreign policy, the reason people treat them like a weird cultist priesthood is that they very often act like a weird cultist priesthood. Instead of trying to explain to my mom why Afghanistan matters and why Pakistan isn't more helpful to us in that regard. Uh, the survey uh, data for the book that Jim and I did uh, on civil military issues comes through very strongly that the public very much wants politicians to do exactly what they are doing, which is objectifying the military and wanting somebody in a uniform right next to them to validate the choices that they're making. Um, and Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> and the, as Janine pointed out, literally the only restraint on our military being much more politically active is the professionalism of the military itself. It is their own professional education and ethos that holds that line. Where it has eroded dramatically, as Matt said, is among veterans. I disagree with Janine that Secretary Mattis uh, is a general. Once you are not on active duty, you are a veteran. And just as we shouldn't exceptionally celebrate them and think they're uniquely qualified for these jobs, it also shouldn't preclude them from making contributions to the Republic, even after they've retired. I am uncomfortable with the politicization, with endorsements, yeah. but that ship has sailed. Um, moreover, the American public very much likes, uh, likes veterans doing what both John Allen and Mike Flynn did, which is wrap their political candidates in the flag and validate their foreign and national security policy judgments. What we see happening, Peter Fever's research and Jim Goldby's research and Lindsey Collins' research shows very clearly that public attitudes on the military are changing. They're becoming a lot more like public attitudes about the Supreme Court. Namely, I like it when they agree with the policies I support. And then I have doubts about these guys when they don't support my policies. The last thing I would say is that anybody know which country in the Middle East the United States has the highest approval ratings in? It's Iran, the country with which we have the least engagement. And that too is actually a secret to how popular the American military is because 50 years into an all volunteer force, most Americans don't know anybody in the military, and they may mistakenly believe that Matt Kavanaugh or J.P. McGee are normal, uh, normal representatives of the institution as opposed to superheroes. And so there's a tendency on the part of the public to treat the military like they're all uniquely virtuous, uh, perfect posture, great citizens, 
instead of understanding that they are no better and no worse than the rest of the American yeah. public because they are us. And good civil military, the solution to almost every problem in civil military relations is treating our military like what they are, which is us. There was no problem in those opening statements. No controversy there. No. So um, to go a little further, uh, not as late as the Civil War, but during and after Vietnam, there was a factor of lack of trust in the military. In part that when America's men and women, our treasure, were drafted to fight in that war, they weren't employed properly. The truth wasn't told. H.R. McMaster writes his book, Dereliction of Duty. Uh, we're transitioning to an all-volunteer force. And so there's a very much of a lack of trust in that institution. It has been rebuilt. Are we in a position of that trust being lost with, you get a $716 billion budget without a whole lot of scrutiny and without a whole lot of justification where the other departments of government are fighting for every dollar. We, we see surveys where parents say they don't want their children to serve in the military. And, and as these military leaders either enter in the fray as retirees or take key positions in the government, if they don't do well, is trust going to erode? Because this is a huge factor, I would believe, in this, this balance. Clausewitz writes about the balance between the people, the government, and the military. Is, is trust a problem or going to be a problem? Well, I, I, I guess I, if I could pitch in on that, I, I think it's important not to conflate too many different things. Um, you know, I, I'm not happy if parents really are opposed to their kids going into military service. On the other hand, would I like to see the Pentagon treated skeptically? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I keep on thinking of that phrase, I've loved wisely and therefore not too well. Um, <laughs> it, you know, skepticism is, is an important thing. It's also important to remember, you know, this is not just sort of the outside looking in. It's also how the military behaved. One of the reasons why you know, the military came into rather bad odor in, uh, during the Vietnam War. You know, it had to do with the five o'clock follies in uh, Vietnam, or briefings of things that were clearly untrue, promises of the end of, uh, light at the end of the tunnel, which didn't really look like that, and, and so on and so forth. As I said, a, you know, a healthy norm would be a certain amount of friction, certainly a healthy amount of, uh, of skepticism that's, that's built into the system that we can live with. And if I, I'll just say, there's so much to say on this. I'll just say one thing. I think, and I, first I thought these were wonderful, uh, really wonderful statements, all, all of which I, I agree with, um, except for a couple of quibbles with Corey, but that's an old story. The, the, uh, no, there's a lot that we could do to reestablish some of the connections between the military and the society. And... You know, that includes really making sure that there's a bit more of a military presence around the country. So one thing, I'll just pick on the Army. I've always thought it's a terrible idea that the Army is concentrated into these mega bases like Fort Hood or, God help you, Fort Polk. Um, <laughs> those of you who have been to Fort Polk know what I'm talking about. Uh, Fort Benning, which in one way is very convenient, but it means take my own part of the country, New England. When I was growing up, Fort Devens was an active mi military installation. Uh, when I went through ROTC, that's where we did our, uh, our drills. It was there, it was part of the community. There'd be people going back and forth. It's why it is economically completely inefficient to have ROTC programs at all kinds of educational institutions around the country. If, I understand why the military likes to double down on places like Texas A&M, which can generate oodles and oodles of perfectly qualified officers, but it means that you're, you're making sure that there's a whole generation of college graduates that don't really know anybody who's in military service. So I think you know, if we're interested in solutions, we should be looking at, you know, I, I think Matt Kavanaugh's point about bot going bottom up is really important for diagnosing the problem. It's also important for thinking about remedies, and that's, that is the sort of bottom up solution I'd, I'd be very much in favor of. Um, I, don't, I don't necessarily think that, well, I think that the main issue is that the vast majority of Americans are sort of checked out. They're not just checked out on the military because they don't serve in the military or know someone who serves in the military or know someone who knows someone who serves in the military. That's one part of the problem. But they're also sort of checked out on foreign affairs as well. And so whereas in the Vietnam War, I would assume people, we know people were watching this on TV every night. Um, 
because they knew somebody that was over right. there. And so they were deeply interested in it. And um, number one, number two, the media were covering it. <laughs> Today, the media covers the palace intrigue of the White House, right? So the, the Americans that I talk to are very, they're, it's, a, it's, it's a very foreign thing to them. The, the culture of the military and even um, international affairs. And so um, they would have to be paying more attention to um, be more, to have more scrutiny. And I, you know, all of us have, all of us have probably this person in their family, but you know, my, my brother, who's really smart, but doesn't study this for a living, he's all, sort of like my Napoleon's corporal, because he'll come to me and he'll say things like, what the hell's going on in Iraq? You know, <laughs> sort of like, I mean, I, you know, I've been trying to keep up, but it just seems like we're kind of screwing it up. And uh, I mean, he's a smart person. He reads The Economist. He keeps up. And, and you know, but it doesn't affect his daily life. And so he, you know, to the vast majority of Americans, whether they trust the military or not trust the military to execute its mission abroad is one thing. Whether they're going to let their um, son or daughter join the military is another thing. And those things are somewhat separate, but they're, they are, um, alike in that there's just this sort of lack of, of awareness. So um, I, think, I think ironically it leads to just sort of like, I guess it's okay. They're doing all right, right? They, they seem like they have good posture and, you know, they, <laughs> they're doing all right. My and, wife wouldn't yeah, say that. Right. My wife wouldn't say that. So I, I, don't see, I don't see that sort of lack of trust yet. So I would actually echo Dr. Cohen's point um, mostly be, in part because I'm from St. Paul, Minnesota, and uh, it was strange for me leaving high school to go to a school like West Point. I felt uh, awkward or, it, um, it, you know, it was, it, you know, people were excited, but nobody really knew what it meant, and I sure didn't know what it meant other than four years of unpleasantness. Um, and I... I that's my start point, sort of, actually, when we're talking about maintaining a trust relationship with the American public. Um, a trusting relationship is give and take, is equivalent on some level. It's not fawning. Um, and I actually, uh, I think it was almost a year ago, maybe some of you are familiar with a, a professor at the Naval Academy named Bruce Fleming. And uh, he's an English professor that uh, attended the Naval Academy's graduation and uh, wrote uh, an op-ed in the Baltimore Sun uh, that was incredibly critical of what he believed was over-adulation and over-praise um, of the sacrifices of the midshipmen to graduate that day. Setting aside the fact that it's a graduation day and hyperbole is kind of the norm, you, you tell graduates how perfect they are that day. Um, when I read it, I actually got upset. I uh, could feel like heat coming under my skin, like probably a little bit like right now. Um, and my, my, my gut reaction was born of the fact that I had just come back from the tour in Korea that I mentioned, which was unaccompanied. And uh, it was a very difficult year. I, I don't need to dwell on that. But uh, one example is that I tried uh, FaceTime with my uh, four-year-old. And she got so upset after we hung it up that we never did it again. She couldn't differentiate the screen from why dad's not home. So I took this uh, general statement of the military not being special personally, and I shouldn't have. Um, and when I came down off of my high horse, I recognized, and I, I, I wrote as much later and realized that um, I would absolutely agree that we're not special particularly because my parents, my mom's a special education teacher in a high poverty part of St. Paul, or was, she's retired now. And dad signed up for the TSA as soon as he could after September 11th. So I'm well aware that there's a lot of folks out there uh, in this room even, mostly probably, that, that serve something larger than themselves and that you, service to something higher than oneself is not special to the military. But I would say that it's also fair to say that what we do is unique. Um, I had just learned, uh, uh, Admiral James Stavridis mentioned at a thing offhand that he had spent 11 years at sea, which made me feel like my one year of heartache with my family made that a little bit less painful. But, um, and then of course, Senator McCain, his five and a half years, I think, in Hanoi. Yes. Um, and so I, 
I wish that as the relationship goes that, that we were treated less special and, and more just distinct or, or one way, one flavor of service. Although the free bag thing at airports is cool. <laughs> so so nice. uh, the public has an enormous amount of trust in the military. Moreover, the surveys that we did for warriors and citizens show that the public, uh, while knowing nothing about the American military, nonetheless gets a lot of the big issues in civil military relations right. So for example, they hold the elected political leadership responsible for whether we are winning or losing yeah. the war. And that's appropriate, because our elected political leaders are the people who aggregate our societal preferences and determine how much blood and treasure and political effort to put into the war. Uh, where the trust issue I do think is dangerous, um, maybe not more so than in other times, but, but still worrying, is that uh, what we saw in survey responses from political elites is a growing distrust of military advice, a belief that the military is political and gaming them, and, and this is where uh, veterans being so politically vocal as John Allen and Mike Flynn were uh, affects the active duty military because it creates the perception that these guys are all political actors and just waiting to be unveiled and that they are not giving sound, sensible military advice. And that's absolutely not what our active duty military leadership looks like to itself. So there is a fair amount of friction at that level. But the civil military, the civilian, the norms of an unequal playing field that Eliot so beautifully has drawn out in his work also hold, right? That the elected leadership's got a right to be stupid and wrong because they're the elected leadership. And, and it doesn't matter. The military is unquestionably subordinate and the military views itself as unquestionably subordinate, but the political leadership ceases to think of them in that way. And that's, I think, where the friction is coming now. Thanks. We're going to go to questions in just a minute. I'm going to ask one more. What's the role of the active duty admirals and generals vice the retirees regarding strategy, budget, media, and the political process? How do you see uh, what should be separate and what's mingled? Because sometimes when that military leader comes on the news at night and uses their title, Americans may not differentiate between that. So what's the role between the active duty serving Guard, reserve, teammates in uniform, and the retirees. Corey, I know you've got thoughts on this. Let's go this way this time. What okay. do you think? Uh, so the public uses retirees as a proxy for the active duty. Uh, and uh, veterans who take a political role uh, bear culpability for changing public attitudes about the military, and very often in politicized and negative ways. What uh, what Lieutenant General McMaster, as an active duty national security advisor, defending the president's comportment in the meetings with the Russians, for example. Um, that may be very useful to the president. It's actually quite bad for the Army as an institution. Um, and so it's true with active duty military folks in very politicized jobs. My own view is that active duty people in those kinds of roles are both too political and not political enough. They are so political that they cause people to think about the military differently and in a more politicized way. And they are, in almost every instance I can think of, not political enough to be really good, effective politicians. Um, and so, so it's typically not helpful. Retirees, um, you know, they are changing people's attitudes. They are making policy people think differently about the military. And it's making policy people hesitant to, to bring military active duty leaders into their confidence, to tell them what they really think, to have that kind of open and free-flowing exchange that good high-level policy requires. So yeah, I do think it's problematic. Great. Matt, you've written about this. What do you think? Yeah, I'm going to sort of sidestep the active duty generals and admirals part. Um, 
but the retired community, um, I think that it can be a very powerful tool. Um, Dr. Shockey just mentioned, for example, that the American public, there's a gap in knowledge and understanding about modern war. Um, it's in part why the book on Star Wars and strategy, to be honest. Um, but the, I think that it can be a very powerful tool in helping the American public better understand and get better informed on very important decisions that frankly involve a lot of people's lives. Um, I've gotten to know uh, Lieutenant General Mark Hurtling. Uh, I served with his son uh, in Iraq. Um, I got to know him through that, and he's with MWI as well. And he's an analyst, a military analyst for CNN. And he takes that role very seriously and is very careful, tries to be as careful as humanly possible about the remarks that he makes and ensuring that he's speaking on matters of policy and not um, getting into terrain that makes life problematic or difficult for people on the active, in the active force. Um, that being said, uh, there is the, the presidential endorsement problem, and I think it is a problem, um, continues to grow and fester, and uh, there, there is skepticism that that genie could ever be put back in the bottle. Um, I am hopeful that it could, uh, because when you consider that there are 7,000, roughly 7,000 retired generals and admirals out there walking around the United States, the fact that 500 endorsed in the 2012 election cycle and about 200 in the 2016 election cycle tells me that there's, that's the tip of the iceberg, and I'm hopeful that the rest of the folks that are under the surface of the water that want to uphold the principles of the profession um, would be more vocal about staying neutral. Um, but uh, there's work to be done on that. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's another manifestation of um, the amount of respect that we have for the retired um, generals and admirals, the, the uniformed military, that people do look to these retired retirees to help them make sense of um, foreign affairs and national security. So it's another sort of manifestation of, the, of, a, of a type of power that they do have, and they have to um, recognize that. Um, I'm not so sure that as a community, they've really got their heads around that responsibility, the way they have their heads around the responsibility of civilian control as active duty members. I just think this conversation is really starting to pick up a lot more because of the trends um, that, you, that you speak of. And so the, the one thing that really I find troubling is the politicization of these groups of retirees, it's like a competition among the presidential candidates to see how yeah. many they can collect. Yeah. And um, that, the, that these senior retired military officers allow that to happen is a little, um, it's a little troubling to me. I mean, my own father's a, a retired two-star. He's 80 now almost, and um, you know, he, he gets, Everybody wants, you know, they don't really care who he was or what he did in the military. You know, he's a Supply Corps Naval officer. He wasn't a, a huge strategist. Um, they just want his name on the bottom of the sheet. Yeah. And I find that really distasteful. Yeah. Um, and so that, that, that's really troubling. Okay. And yet you endorsed a political candidate and you would deny your father that ability. No, I mean, I do think there's something fundamentally different about, about admirals and generals. They have, they have a level of respect from their 30 and 40 years of service that is not the same as even if, if you get out as a major, you're not, it's not the same. Yeah, no one's gonna listen um, to me. Yeah, no I'm just some, no, no one's listening. you know, no. you know it's, it, I do think it's a little different. I think one of the wisest things that um, Corey pointed out though was this, this issue of the politicization of an active duty officer and the um, HR as an example that, um, you know, he's in an awkward position because that position requires someone who's a political animal. And that's an uncomfortable and unfair position to put a three-star um, in. And you pointed that out, if, if, I mean, last year, and I think that that's a really important insight. Uh, okay, I don't have time to be diplomatic. So um, first thing, I've yet to meet a retired general or flag officer who says, just call me mister. They go by general or admiral. Secondly, there is a big distinction between what is legal and what is right. Legally, they can endorse people, they can do all that stuff. I once in an op-ed said, 
it's also perfectly legal for them to go off after retirement and become pole dancers in Las Vegas. And, and that's the most important thing. Wow, I did not unquote. need that visual. <laughs> <laughs> which, which got me ang angry emails from a couple of general officers, and then I have to part. report a bunch of emails from colonels saying, let me nominate a few. <laughs> uh, I, I, think that, I think the truth is most retired general and flag officers understand that they have a special kind of status and actually are quite careful about it. But, but the fact is, I believe they have responsibilities which go on afterwards. I, I, want to do, I do want to pick on the active duty thing. So I spent two years with that cult, what did you call them? A bunch of cultists <laughs> taking a, a swipe at my <laughs> diplomatic brethren in arms oh, uh, who, who are really the Foreign Service who actually are quite misunderstood and, and quite selfless and in some cases extraordinarily courageous. Yes. Um, in a way that so I was a senior official in the State Department and I can tell you, having spent a lot of time in the Deputies Committee, that Friends of mine in the Joint Staff had absolutely no problem giving me terrible advice about foreign policy. They were extremely free with it. They would not <laughs> respond nearly as well if I gave them probably terrible, but maybe not, advice about military affairs. So I confined myself to asking awkward questions, which made them mad instead. <laughs> I think it's very important to remember that just because you're a general does not mean you have good foreign policy judgment. Right. In fact, it often means you have terrible foreign policy judgment. <laughs> I'm not joking. You know, the greatest strategist, supposedly, in the United States Army was a man, and before World War II, was a man you have never heard of, Stanley Embick. He was, you talk about America first, he was a real America firster. He was against any kind of aid to Great Britain. His judgment about the world was awful. And I've met plenty of general officers whose foreign policy I've used, I believed, were not particularly well informed and not particularly helpful. That's not an argument for having you know, bright lines of separation. In, it is in the nature of policy making that there'll be give, give and take and back, back and forth. But I think that, you know, what, Senior level military leadership gives you, it gives you expertise in whatever your field is. You know, do I trust admirals to be experts in counterinsurgency? Not so much. You know, would I want General Frickley to be running some major fleet problem? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. uh, there, so there is a specific area of expertise and there's a kind of general leadership experience and, and gravity that, that goes along, I believe, with those experiences. It does not necessarily translate, it can, but it does not necessarily translate into expertise on policy. There you go. Okay, how about a question? Right there. Please. <laughs> this is Hi, Austin Bird, uh, Army National Guard. Um, so two questions. First, I think we've asked the wrong question. It should be, have we given the Pentagon too much responsibility? Have we asked uh, the military to do too many things? And, mm -hmm. With all that has come the, the power. The second thing I would say is at the grand strategy level, is it not essential for our admirals and generals to be a part of policy making and absolutely in politics? Thank you. Anybody? Well, okay, so the first one. I mean, who else is gonna run military things if not the Pentagon, A? And B, a lot of the missions that we assume, well, boy, that's not military business Actually, it is military business and historically always has been. I would just point out military governance yeah. as one which we fell down on in the biggest possible way in the aftermath of the invasion of Iraq in 2003. I mean, I remember getting fingers in the chest from my rate general officer friends when I became temporarily diplomat. You know, why isn't the State Department here running Basra or something? The answer is, you know, when Hurricane Katrina goes, happens, the mayor of New Orleans doesn't say, please send me three ambassadors as soon as you can. <laughs> the, military, the military has the resources, it has the manpower, it has the logistical expertise to do all and kinds of things. And I don't think they're being asked to do things which are inappropriate, particularly if you know anything about military history. Grand strategy, I have a problem because I don't really believe it exists, but the fact of the matter anyway, is that in normal governmental processes, the military is absolutely heard. You know, if you have NSC meetings, the secretary's gonna be there, chances are the chairman will be there, deputies committee meetings, there'll be the J5, the J3. The problem is not that the military voice doesn't get heard, trust me. 
And even Dereliction of Duty, HR's uh, book, which is a good book, there's a problem with the premise, which is that somehow LBJ didn't know what the generals thought. He knew exactly what the generals thought. He just didn't want to listen to them, that's all. Right, and that is his prerogative. Which is right. his prerogative, or was. Right, so I mean, we've both written on this, but I mean, I think that the, it isn't that the, that the military is not at the table, and it isn't that they're not saying stuff. It's that the civilians and the military talk a different language, yeah. and they don't understand each other. And that is probably a problem of education. I mean, we don't have any control over where the civilians come from and, where the, and how they arrive at this table. Um, we have to do a really a much better job in helping them have this, this dialogue that you call the unequal dialogue, because at the end of the day, the civilians get to make the call whether they listen to the military or not. And that presupposes that they understand, right? And so I think that's, that's and I'm with you on grand strategy too. They, they also lead different lives, and I think this is a really important thing. If you're, as you're a general officer, you will probably never really have anybody yell at you, or it'll be rare. You'll be treated <laughs> with more and more deference the further you go up. So if you're a politician, or for that matter, a professor, the higher up you go, the more people you have every day in your face saying, you're an idiot. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, and, and it's it, a it really, really good does breed different ways of interacting with people, I think. Okay, since we're between you all and lunch, uh, we're going to break for lunch, and you, the panelists will be around. Uh, let's not any of us be yelled at as idiots, and I want to thank <laughs> the panel for a great job.